happy to keep this at the very sort of helicopter type of overview to briefly give you an update as to what we are doing, where we stand with any conference, and then uh, leave as much time as possible to uh, discussion. The Hague Conference on Private International Law, um, first of all, probably recall that its origin goes back to 1823, so we have been around for, for quite some time. Um, what distinguishes the organization from other organizations uh, represented here is that we deal exclusively and only with private international law questions. We don't do any substantive. Um, I have distributed for you this status chart of our uh, conventions and our work. And I think it's, it's a good sort of um, exercise to uh, explain the nature of our work to you. You see on the left side the list of the 38 conventions that we currently have on the table. Um, I will be very honest and, and, and humble and frank with you, not all of these 38 conventions are equally important, not all of them are actually in force, but I think you can easily identify 10 to 12 core hate conventions that have been widely ratified or among the new conventions that do really address important topics. They can be roughly categorized into three different categories. You have the family law and child protection conventions. You have the legal cooperation law, what I would refer to as the international civil procedure conventions. Then you have more the commercial and finance law uh, topics. Um, this status chart shows you which member of the organization is party to which convention and if you turn the chart around you see which non-member is party to what convention. Um, that brings me to the first uh, basic point about the hate conference that the state does not have to be a member of the organization, therefore doesn't have to pay uh, contribute to the budget of the organization to benefit from the work of our uh, organization and thus to join uh, a, a convention, a state convention, a free right if you want. And one of the things that I want to do as uh, Secretary General is to ensure that as many states that are on the back of this chart, listed as non-member contracting states, move to this side of the chart and are listed as a member of the organization and become more involved in the world of that world. Um, this other little document that I uh, have prepared for you shows the membership of the Hague Conference in, uh, in a different form of a map. You see the dark blue uh, colored states are all members of the organization. We currently have 74 member states plus the European Union, which makes 75. We have uh, two states that have been admitted as members but still need to accept our statute officially to become a member with Canada, Colombia, and Lebanon. And I'm very pleased to say that for the first time in the modern history of the conference, we have three candidate states in the pipeline, which are going through the six-month uh, old period to become a member of the organization, Azerbaijan, Singapore, and Lebanon. Now, when you look at this particular part of the world, you see that the map is fairly colored. It's good. It's nice to see all this involvement of uh, the states of uh, the Americas in the work of the Hague Conference. There are clearly other challenges in Africa and different challenges again also in Asia Pacific. The visibility of the work of the Hague Conference in the Americas is high, it's great, and uh, we are very, very happy. If you turn uh, the chart and you look to the other side of the map, you see all the states that are connected to the work of the Hague Conference by either being a member of the organization or a contracting state. And here we're talking about 142 states around the world that are connected to the work of the Hague Conference. That is what I think makes us a global, truly global organization. But there is clearly more work to be done. Um, what is 
important to um, emphasize also in my view is that we are not just this global organization with the headquarters in The Hague. We have two regional offices. We have a regional office in Buenos Aires uh, since 2005 where we have a representative of the organization who actually, and I very much like this image, who talks as a local to the region, to the local. I always say it's one for a person from The Hague to go into a region and to explain conventions and the nature of our work. It's quite a different thing to have someone from within the region to try to convey that very same message. Someone who speaks the language, understands the culture, has an affinity with the, 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 the local uh, the legal systems uh, in place. I think it's a much more effective message here. We have had this office in Buenos Aires, as I said, since 2005 it has made a huge difference in terms of increasing the visibility of the work, the acceptability of the work of the Hague Conference. I very much look forward to seeing Nacio Goitwichea, our man in, in Buenos Aires, to uh, take part in OAS meetings to represent uh, the, uh, the, uh, the work of the, of the Hague Conference within OAS and to cooperate uh, together with the Indeed, the, the work of this regional office was so successful that in December 2012 uh, we opened another regional office in uh, Hong Kong. And if you look at the map, you can easily imagine where in future hopefully there will be another regional office and will be one for five years. As I said, the, the conventions, three categories, family law, international civil procedure, commercial and finance law, so we're talking about child abduction convention, we're talking about inter-country adoption convention, we're talking about the child protection convention, we're talking about a new convention on maintenance obligations. These are all very important national standards that uh, you know, set standards for the effective cooperation among states with a view to protecting vulnerable people, children in this case, from the harmful effects of uh, child abduction to ensure that cross-border adoption only takes place in the best interest of the child, that we eliminate intermediaries in the cross-border adoption process whose only idea and purpose and goal is to make money, uh, which is not what you want, obviously, uh, to, effect, to establish a sound system of uh, inter-country adoption that only takes place if and when there is no better solution for the child within his own state. But then you also have the field of uh, civil procedure where we have the convention on how to serve process abroad, how to take evidence abroad. There is a convention on access uh, to justice. I cannot go into the details of these uh, conventions within the uh, limited uh, amount of time we, we have, but we are talking about conventions that are enforced in uh, 90, uh, 60, 70 uh, states, which have a very high um, relevance uh, around, the, around the world. The most successful of all the hate conventions is the Apostille Convention, the Apostille. 105 uh, contracting states. This is a convention that does away with the legalization uh, of public documents. Uh, so if you have to produce a birth certificate, a marriage certificate, a death certificate, uh, a judgment, a patent, a public school uh, diploma that has been executed in one state and that needs to be produced in another state, you typically have to go through a very cumbersome, slow and costly legalization process that takes uh, 10 months and you end up with a document full of signatures and stamps and ribbons and you can hardly read the original document anymore. The Apostille Convention is away with that and replaces it with a single um, formality, which is the issuance of democracy. Sounds very mundane, but has a huge impact on people's life. On, and I very much like your, 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 your image, John Chair, because that's really what this is all about. And the basic reason why I like my work, because we do have an impact on citizens, people's life, or businesses that conduct their production. And who need to have legal certainty and predictability to know what sort of legal framework applies to their cross-border uh, movements and uh, transactions. 
something as mundane as the Apostille Convention is openly, effectively supported now by the World Bank as a means to facilitate foreign direct investment. Because they say it cuts away, it does away with the red tape, it, it, it facilitates um, the, uh, uh, the formalities that are needed before you can accept a foreign uh, incoming public document. But this is good for foreign direct investment, it is good for the economic development of, uh, of the country. Um, the commercial and, and finance law side of things is a bit more in development still within the Hague Conference. We have a fairly new convention on intermediate securities that complements uh, other instruments that have been developed among other um, organizations, but which essentially addresses the question as to what law applies when uh, you have a transaction involving intermediate securities and have securities that are provided for example as collateral to finance uh, Deal. As a collateral uh, provider, you want to know which law governs the perfection requirements, for example, of all of these uh, securities that are provided as collateral so that you get an effective security interest that you can enforce against the uh, general creditors of the collateral table. In the pipeline as to future work, uh, we have the idea to uh, work on a global on the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments in civil and commercial matters. Such a convention does not exist yet. I find that remarkable. I find that surprising that the very core topic of the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments has not led to a global instrument yet. Uh, we would like to revive past efforts that were undertaken and uh, give it another attempt to try to develop such a convention on the, uh, on the global scale. We have a completely different topic also in the pipeline on surrogacy arrangements um, and to establish um, the filiation of children born out of surrogacy uh, arrangements. You may think what you want of this type of arrangements. Fact is that often children are born out of these arrangements in states that do not recognize surrogacy arrangements, or children are brought back into states where the surrogacy arrangements are regarded as being contrary to public policy, and at the end of the day you have a child there that has no affiliation, that has no citizenship, and you don't know what, what is the place of this child in, in, in the legal systems in society. So we, we are um, exploring the possibility of uh, embarking on a, on, a, on a convention that will deal with this uh, creation wise uh, children. Um, I should say that the Hague Conference also attaches, and that will be my, my final uh, comment, a very important um, part of, it, of its efforts to the monitoring we firmly believe that it is one thing to put these 30 plus conventions on the table. It's another thing to make sure that they actually work in practice. The biggest challenge of global instruments is that these instruments may be applied, may be interpreted differently in different parts of the world. And that is a danger for the overall effect of these international treaties. Because if they are being applied in different ways in different parts of the world, you lose the benefit of the harmonization and the uh, unification of the national law that you were uh, trying to achieve at the, uh, at the first place. So currently about 70% of our resources go into post-convention services uh, with a view to train judges, train government officials, train practitioners, train lawyers, notaries, uh, what have you, to uh, make sure that they understand the conventions uh, in the right way, that these conventions are properly implemented and are applied uh, correctly and interpreted correctly in the different uh, jurisdictions. This is in a very nutshell, uh, sort of a whole, any proper view type of uh, approach. Uh, a few remarks I wanted to share with you on the World Bank Conference. 